So, uh, as Chris said, my name is Raphael. Uh, I've been a member of Kings over t over ten years now. So, uh, um, so this week, uh, this today, we will continue with a series uh, going without knowing. Uh, we are looking at Abraham's journey and his call to inherit the land that belonged to the Canaanites. And last week, Dan talked about the ups and downs of Abraham joining in terms of inheriting the land. But central to this very core of inheriting land is the promise of his son Isaac. So today, what we are going to be looking at, we are going to examine the joining of Abraham as he clings to the promise of God for the promised child. We know that God has been speaking to us about church planting and also in our individual lives as well. God has given some of us promises and so on and so forth. So as we look at the journey of Abraham, we believe that God will speak to us, will teach us, will learn from some of his mistakes and we believe that this will strengthen our heart so that we can actually inherit the promises God has spoken to us as a church and also as individuals. The bottom line is that in spite of the ups and downs, Isaac was eventually born. And that is my confidence that God will inspire us today. No matter the ups and downs you may have gone through in terms of the things God has spoken to you, your Isaac, your promise will also be fulfilled. And clinging to the promises of God for the birth of Isaac, I want to portray this as a faith adventure. In every adventure, there's always a start. So that we're going to look at the start of the adventure. We are going to look at the, the, the roller coaster of the adventure. And then we are going to look at the end of the adventure. So I get to start to for us see what how did this adventure actually start for Abraham? So we'll go to the next slide and we'll pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. We sang of your goodness. We sang of your faithfulness. And Lord, that faithfulness again is, a, is portrayed in this journey of Abraham. We pray you will speak to our hearts. We pray you will open our eyes to know you more and more. Holy Spirit, we receive your help today. Unveil your word and touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this adventure actually starts with a very clear promise from God. I know that we read this passage last week, but I believe this lays a very strong foundation for the faith journey and adventure of Abraham. So we start from reading Genesis 15, 2 to 6, and Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elysia of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and the member of my household will be my head. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very old son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteous. So we see here, this is how the faith adventure of Abraham started. A very clear promise. God saying to him that I will give you a son. I will give you a son. And God brought him out and showed him the stars. That as many as, if you can count the stars, so shall your offspring be. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God. The fact that God brought Abraham and showed him the stars was just to give him that assurance, as it were, a sign to assure his heart that God, God will perform what he has promised. This is very, very foundational in terms of our faith work with God. 
A faith walk with God is not a wishful thinking. We don't believe God because I wish God would do that. Abraham was not just wishing. It was a clear promise upon which Abraham was actually standing. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. We have all been called by faith to live by faith. Our faith journey in every area of our life must be rooted and granted on the very clear promise of God on the word of God. So if you look at some examples, for instance, when, the word, when God, angel appeared to Mary and said, you have a son, and that son will become Jesus. Mary said, let it be to me according to your word. So there was that clear promise, that clear word upon which Mary was actually standing upon. In the case of Paul, when Paul was being taken to, uh, to appear before Caesar, and uh, we know they had a voyage and there were storms, and the Bible said that they, there was the lost hope of everybody, of anyone actually surviving. But in the night, an angel will appear to Paul and say that, I have given to you all that say with you. And then Paul will stand before the, the captain and say, take heart, men, for I believe God, it will be just as it was told me. So people, so our faith work must be rooted on a clear promise of God or the word of God and not just a wishful thinking. So at times, that could be because you have a promise from God or, or you have the word of God, the promise of God you're actually standing upon. We can look at the life of David when he had that, uh, when he defeated Goliath. He was standing on the covenant of circumcision. When he saw Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised man that he should defy the armies of God? He was believing God on the fact that he, they are peculiar people on the basis of a very clear covenant with God. So our faith work with God must be based on the very foundation of either a promise from God or a clear word from the Bible. So are you believing God for something? The next question is, what promise or Bible passage are you actually standing upon? They have to be down, because that's what God has said. God's faithfulness is attached to his word. God is faithful to his word. So our faith work must start with a very clear promise from God, or we have scriptures we're actually standing upon. And the Bible says, in the mouth of two to three witnesses, a thing should be confirmed. So if you are believing God for something, always good to look for at least two Bible passages to base your faith on. God, I believe in you because this is what you said. And so your faith is rooted on the clear promise of God. So that was the start of the adventure. The next phase we are going to look at now is the roller coaster of the adventure. If you notice, there was something missing from God's promise. There was something missing. There was no gunshot or, or timeline. God did not put any timeline at all. So as time passes, Abraham and Sarah will really struggle with this because the time was keep going, keep going, and nothing seemed to be happening. So what we are going to look at now, how did Abraham, Abraham and Sarah cope with this timeless promise? And so let's read some passages we're going to read a, bit, a few passages this time, then we're going to look at some of the main points that we can actually learn from these passages. So the first one is Genesis 16, 1 to 4. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing child, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. After Abraham has dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. 
And we know the remaining part of the story. Ishmael was born, and the peaceful, harmonious family of Abraham was in disarray. Sarah would accuse, would tell Abraham, that God judge between me and you. And, and, and Abraham would tell um, Sarah, where is your maid? Do whatever you please. And Sarah would send her guy away, and so on and so forth. So the peaceful relationship that have always existed was thrown into total disarray as a result of this action. Let us look at the second passage from Genesis 17, 15 to 19. So Ishmael was born, just to put in a context, was born when Abraham was 86 years old. So for 13 years, God was quiet. Nothing happened for 13 years. Now, when Abraham was 99 years old, God will appear to him again and will make a covenant with him. And we'll read from there. Genesis 17, 15 to 19. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, be a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So that happened. We'll read the last passage before we begin to look at some of the things we can learn from this. Now we move to chapter 18, just to give you an introduction before the next passage. So God will appear again to Abraham, this time as three men, you know, just appeared visiting him while he was in the tent. Abraham will welcome them and will prepare a very laborious meal for them. Sarah will bake some cakes, they will address a, a, a very young tender calf and presented the meal before them, they were eating and then we we'll, we'll hear what happens. And then they said to Abraham, where is Sarah your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, were advanced in age, and Sarah has passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely be a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied the saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, you did laugh. So we can see the roller coaster of the adventure. It was like a straight line. So we're going to look at some points that we can actually learn from this adventure. The first point is the difficulty of waiting and the temptation of a shortcut. As I said before, God's promises, they have no gunshot or timeline. And as Peter Lewis, the author of the book, God's Hall of Fame, said, many of God's checks, they are post-dated, and you don't even know the date of the check. So it calls for patience. Waiting gets more difficult when you have been waiting for a long time for what society considers as an essential issue of life. 
like having a child. Society will think that is an essential issue of life, or maybe even progressing in your work, or you wanting, wanting to be get to get married. Yet there's no maybe no apparent pro, uh, prospect of seeing your hopes and dreams realized. So in the case of Abraham and Sarah, central to their very future, their core of inheriting the land was the birth of Isaac. And it seemed that that future was in jeopardy. So tired of waiting, Sarah and Abraham yielded to the temptation of a shortcut, and Ishmael was born. It was said, Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. Does that remind you of something? Adam and Eve. Adam will listen to the voice of Eve. So Abraham will listen to the voice of Sarah and will know what happened. Ishmael was born. Short cuts can have very huge consequences. The first thing that happened that the relationship between Abraham and Sarah was God strained. Hagar looked down, Sarah, she was sent away. And if you can look back over history, you can see the consequences of having Ishmael. So short cuts have consequences. At the same time, if you look at it, short cuts are like the opportunities that present themselves to us for us to actually fulfill God's purpose for our life by our own effort. That is what short cuts are. The opportunity that actually they present before us. Opportunities for us to take action to fulfill the purpose, the promise of God by our own action. It reveals the state of our heart. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, it was impatience, anxiety about the future, and the lack of trust in God to fulfill what he has promised. And I want you to contrast this with David. David was anointed as king when he was 17 years old, and he was pursued from place to place by Saul. And it happened that as Saul was pursuing David, he, he was resting one time in, in, in the cave. And David had the opportunity to actually kill, to kill Saul. So the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I give you your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seemed good to you. But David would not. He says he will not touch the Lord's anointed. He only cut a portion of his garment. David had the opportunity then to actually fulfill God's promise by his own action, if he really wanted to. But he would not. He would rather believe God and trust God to fulfill what he has promised. So shortcuts, the opportunities that present themselves to us to fulfill God's promise by our own action, reveal the state of our heart. But the good news is this. God do not reject us or dump us because of our shortcuts. The idea that shortcuts will bring out what is in our heart and God will refine us. God is interested not just in the end product, but in the process. So God will use shortcuts to show us the state of our heart and he will work with us to refine us through those shortcuts. You find that Abraham was so refined and grew in faith to the extent that he was willing later on to actually sacrifice Isaac. The Bible said in the book of Hebrew that he actually believed that God will raise him from the dead. So you can compare Abraham at this particular stage to what he eventually became, a man of faith. He has worked with God. God had refined him. Now he could stand to believe God that even if involved raising Isaac from the dead, he was ready to obey God. So shortcuts have consequences, but they reveal the state of our heart. But we praise God that he do not reject us because of that, but he works with us. He refines us. He makes us stronger to be the people that he wants us to be. I just really want to add this as a general comment. Shortcuts are more likely when you've had a long day 
The day has gone wrong. Everything is going not the way you want it. And when you come home, the devil will bring to you everything that has not been going right in your life because you had a very bad day. The advice is don't make a major decision when you are in a such a situation. Do not make a major decision when you had a very bad day, where the day is rotten and everything seems to have worked against you. You are likely to make a decision that will be a shortcut. The next thing that I would like us to look at is contending with the reality of our circumstances. And I want to look at two passages. So when God appeared again after 13 years of silence and spoke to Abraham that you, your Sarah will actually have a son. The Bible says Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall I have a child, be born to a man who is 100 years old, shall Sarah who is 90 years old also be a child? And then we hear Sarah's part of the story. And when they, they visited the town, Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I, have ple- shall I have pleasure? So both of them laughed. They have come to a place where they believe it was impossible because of their age. They've come to a place where they believe the biological clock is gone. And there was no way for God to do what he has promised the lost sight of the promise of God. So there are two outstanding issues here. The physical circumstances that say no and the promise of God. The question is, what are you going to believe? What are you going to believe? And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 9, it says, if we receive the testimony of men, our circumstances, the testimony of God is greater. Even when our circumstances are saying no, when our circumstances are going the opposite direction, God's promises are bigger. God is bigger than all our circumstances. And that is why the Bible says, that is why the, when the angels ask Sarah, is anything too hard for God? We choose to believe God rather than our circumstances. And we can see similar struggles in, in, the, in the life of many people in this journey of faith. For instance, when the Israelites were called from Egypt to go to the promised land and they sent people to, to spy the land, they came back and they saw the giants and the great war and many of them lost sight of what God has promised. They rather believed the circumstances rather than what God promised. In the case of John the Baptist, he was cast into prison. And he got to a place that he actually sent a message to Jesus. I said, are you the one to come? All the way I expect another. So our contending with us, we do not deny our circumstances, not at all. We are not saying, we are not, it's not that we refuse to face the reality of the circumstances that face us. Rather, we choose to believe that God is bigger than our circumstances. And Romans 3, uh, 3 to 4 says, For what if some did not believe? Will their own belief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. Let our circumstances be the liar. God is true. As we hold on, as we walk in our journey of faith, as we stand upon the promises that God has actually spoken to us, and maybe our circumstances are saying the opposite, let God be true and our circumstances be liar. The last one I want us to look at the next slide is, I've, I've said it, I've titled this God's Service Stations in the Adventure. We all know what service stations are. You know you'll be traveling and you really need a place to go to the washroom. You need, you need to buy some food. You need to buy some food. Oh, what a refreshing when you come to a service station. And God also knows that in adventure of faith, we need refreshing. So, for instance, 
in, God will say the same thing many times. So in chapter 17, he said to Abraham, as for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarah again, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give her a son. I will give you a son by her. And then when the angels came again, God will say it again, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. What is God say, doing? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God keeps saying the same thing. God keeps saying the same thing. Faith does not come by having heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing again and hearing again and hearing the word of God again. That is how God refreshes us. Whether we like it or not, we are leaking vessels. If you look at the parable of the sower, it's talking about the seed that fell among the tongues. He said, these are they that fell among the tongues. These are the ones who hear the word. And the case of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, entering in, choke the word. Our struggles for life, all the issues we have to deal with life, over time, the promises begin to lose their grip in our heart. So we keep need to hear it again. God will say it again. God will say it again. Building up their faith. Actually, there's something very significant as well. In chapter 18, when God visited Abraham in the tent, that was the first time actually Sarah heard the promise from God. All the two promises, when God called Abraham, answer, it was only Abraham. When God made the covenant with Abraham, it was only Abraham. But for this time, Sarah, Abraham, heard that word again. And had that, I, must, I could just be said, that was very reassuring. It will not be, it, that, that implies that they can support one another. They have heard the word of God together. And this is very important in our families that you share whatever God is actually saying. That your wife, your spouse, know exactly the clear promise of God. And also for, for our church leaders, they, keep on, they should keep on reminding us of what God has said. So we all are in the same place of faith. We believe in God together because we have heard the word of God over and over again. It places us in a place of common faith, of walking together, of having heard from God together. We can stand together and press into all the things God has promised us. Now to finish off, we're going to look at the joyful end of the adventure. Uh, Genesis 21, 1 to 3. And the Lord visited Sarah as he has said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he has spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. I could just imagine the joy. Isaac has been born. Laughter has been born. At last, God's promise has been fulfilled. But I just want to finish up, just point out at three things. One, God faithfulness. The fact that Isaac was born is not because Abraham and Sarah were so faithful. We know all their ups are down. It is the faithfulness of God. That is where our confidence, that is what actually carries on. It is the faithfulness of God. And so in 2 Timothy 2.13, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God is God's faithfulness. As we hold on to the promises God has spoken to us, it's not your so much of your ability to hold on that we change things. It is the faithfulness. You can rest. You can trust in the faith. God cannot deny himself. That is one of the things I like us to take home. The second time is God's timeline or due line. The word set time was used three times in the whole passage. I've just highlighted the passages where it is used three times. I'm not going to go over that again. It gives us the assurance that God's word will be fulfilled in due time if we will never give up. God, in his own way and wisdom, have a set time. We don't know why, 
But if we will not hold, if we will not give up, if we hold on to what God has promised us, in due time it will be fulfilled. Then the last one is the need for patience. And that is from Hebrews 10, 36 to 38. Say, cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Cast not away your confidence. We have need for patience. We have need for patience. I know patience in this modern society is, is just contrary to the way everything operates. We have the microwave. We have everything that gives us instant solution. But the Bible says, do not cast away your confidence. You have need for patience. Need for patience. The joy shall live by faith. And he says, if any man draw back, my soul have no pleasure in him. So Abraham was called the father of faith, if you read Romans 4. Yes, indeed, he has his ups and downs. But there was there's something about him. He never drew back. He never gave up on God. And my encouragement today for us as a church as God calls us to church planting, as God has spoken to us individual, you have need for patience. Do not cast away your confidence. It may, it may have the yo-yo, although dad doesn't want to use the word yo-yo, but God is faithful. He will bring to pass what he has promised. So we go to spend some time to pray, just to, maybe just a few comments. So if you feel, for instance, you, maybe you have taken some shortcuts, God has not rejected you. And I really want you to pray this morning as we pray, to say, God, I'm coming back. I may have taken some shortcuts, but I'm coming back. I'm putting my trust afresh in you. Have you been waiting for a long time on certain issues of your life? I really want you to renew your faith and confidence again. Look, go back. Go back to those promises. Go back to those service stations. Read again what God has said to you. Read again those scriptures. Build up your faith. God is faithful. He cannot deny himself. Shall we pray? Father, we, we say thank you for your faithfulness. The, the Bible says that the scriptures cannot be broken, that you have exalted your word above your name, that the word of God is incorruptible and lives forever. Thank you for the gift of your word and promise, and that, Lord, in your faithfulness, you always bring your word to pass. We, I pray for strength. I pray for grace. For those who may be struggling with promises, with issues of life, Father, I pray this morning there be a renewal of strength and of faith in you. And those who may feel they may have taken some shock, or thank you that there is forgiveness and restoration, that you will bring restoration, you will refine them, and Lord, you will fulfill in their lives all your promises because of your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. They will just sing a song that then you can round up. Okay, thank you. Let's stand and sing together as a, a response.